Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new week. Uh, let's just begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, maybe one of us can please lead in prayer. Krisha, would you mind leading us in prayer, please? Or Arila, go ahead, Krisha. Yeah, hi. Uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for each and everything, and we pray that your kingdom comes in our life. Lord, as we're going to learn about you and uh, about the evangelism, Lord, we pray that you speak to us through your Holy Spirit, Father. We give this class into your hand, and each and every student and the pastor into your hand, Lord, and we give you all the glory and honor. In the Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you so much, uh, Krisha. So um, last week we completed up to chapter 12, right? Uh, let me just uh, post the notes here. All right. So chapter 12. So we did up to uh, overcoming practical challenges. Uh, we looked at some of the challenges that we will face when, when it comes to evangelism. There'll be threats, there'll be persecutions, abandonment. There'll be people uh, uh, you know, who will stop us uh, from going to a local church. Uh, you know, There'll be uh, people who say, hey, you forced us into certain cultural and religious practices. And, or sometimes you know, people are forced into uh, being married, uh, married to uh, to to marry an unbeliever or a non-believer, and so there are many practical challenges. Right now, here's the thing: as believers, we must understand that uh, these challenges are not new to us. Right. So all through, when we look at the early church, uh, all the persecutions, all the troubles, all the challenges that they went through, it is very similar to what we're going through even now. Right when we look at what's happening in the government and the whole anti-conversion law and all of these things that are happening, it's not new to us. The enemy is just using these strategies uh, to stop the gospel from spreading. Uh, but then again, we must understand that those were different times, cultures, and different seasons. We are in different times, cultures, and seasons right now. And so as believers, we must adapt to the different seasons that we are in, cultures that we are in. But it's very important to understand and be rooted and grounded in the fact that the word of God, the gospel, the spirit of God is still the same. So it's the same word that was being preached in the early church, the same word being preached now. It's the same Holy Spirit that worked in the early church the same Holy Spirit that's working now. Culturally and uh, you know geographically, things are changed, right? Uh, but that is not priority. The priority is, hey, the gospel and the Holy Spirit does not change, right? So we'll get into chapter thirteen. Uh, this class will will be our last class. We'll try and cover most of it, and then uh, we should be done with the sections. Right, so chapter 13, feel free to stop me if you have any kind of question. Chapter 13, strategies for urban evangelism. Now, the word urban, uh, urban missions, urban evangelism is always interchangeable. So the word urban basically refers to cities and towns. Right? So if you look at cities uh, for our nation of India, uh, you got you got cities, then you got those little towns, and you got villages. Right. So what are some of the strategies that you and I can use in terms of urban evangelism? Now, I'm sure most of us are from uh, you know, either cities or towns. Uh, but what are the methods that we can use right now? You know, you know, in an urban setting, you know, people are busy. People have work Monday to Fridays. Uh, even, you know, uh, homemakers are busy because they got things to do. So how can you and I? be fruitful in evangelizing and sharing the gospel right maybe gone are those days when you can you know we stand on the 
street for more than three, four hours and just try to, I mean, we can do that, uh, but we need to come up with some wholesome methods of urban, urban evangelism, right? Now, when you look at wholesome methods, three things come to our mind. Yeah, and I've marked it here in yellow. So the first thing is spirit led, right? Be led by the spirit. Don't do anything uh, that is led by our natural senses, right? Be spirit led. Ask the Holy Spirit, how do I go? How do, what should I say, right? The wisdom of God is important in these uh, scenarios, right? Two, be legal. Now, for example, you're in a city, you're in an urban place, and you know you can't just walk into a, a college. We can't do that, right? We can't walk into a college and then begin to you know talk about Jesus. We can't do that because it's not legal. The college or the school has certain guidelines, certain rules which you have to follow. But we can't just walk into a, a, a an apartment complex or a mall and begin to share the gospel, right? Because nowadays the malls and these apartment complexes they have certain rules they have certain guidelines right so being legal is very important and three is being ethical right so one is spirit led led by the holy spirit two is being legal so doing the right things in the right way right so uh, one of the best examples would be for example if you are planning a, a meeting in an open ground Right, get permissions from the authorities. You know, in that area, probably you can also go to the police station, get a written letter saying that this is a Christian program, and we are not forcing anybody, but this is what we are doing, which is for the Christians. So, get it done in a legal way. Right uh, now, many a times there were, uh, you know, there were problems because you know these people who have you know conducted a meeting, they never took permission from the police or from the authorities and so they were in big trouble so being legal again is very important and ethical is having the right practices right being true to god being true to people not enticing not alluring people saying hey you well if you come to this meeting you know this is what will happen to you you can you know uh you know if you come to this meeting i, I, I will i will give you so much money or uh, you know, all your debts will go, or this will happen. That you know, being ethical, right? Uh, giving the right information in the right way, in an ethical way, right? So, when it comes to urban evangelism, we must become all things to all people, which means we step into their world, right? Now, how do I step into somebody's world? I'm just going to pause the projection right now. So how do I step into somebody else's world, right? Now, for example, you know, there's there's a family that's going through a trouble, right? They're going through maybe uh, a financial problem or they're going through a loss in their family. You know, somebody has passed away. Now, you and I must be able to come to a place where we understand what they're going through. You know, we identify with them. Now, there are two things. One is uh, uh, being emotional, right? And, and and trying to understand their problem. Now, imagine this: if somebody has lost a loved one, right, and you get to talk to that, you know, the person who's lost a loved one, you cannot say, "Hey, you know what? Don't worry." Uh, you 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 can't be very nonchalant. You can't just say, "You know, don't worry," or uh, it's you any words are not going to work that, at that moment what is going to work is you have to empathize with them that is sympathy you feel sad for and you empathize which means you put yourself in their position right now while sharing the gospel many times uh, and we've talked about this right many times we feel okay somehow this person has to come to christ Right? Now, yes, that is the end result, but we also need to understand we are not working with robots. They are human beings who have emotions, they have feelings, they have thoughts, they have things that they are going through. So you and I must be patient. Right? It's a patient. 
we need patience. We have to patiently walk with them, right? And this is something that is, you know, lacking in urban evangelism because everyone are busy. You know, okay, you know, just move on. What is the next thing we want to do? Uh, but remember that in urban cities, in this busy life, there are people who are broken. There are people who are seeking. There are people who are hurt, who are lost, who are suicidal, who are, you know, who are just going through a very difficult time in their life. You and I need to empathize with them. Right? Empathize. Hey, you know what? I I haven't gone through this, but I really feel that, you know, I, I really feel what you're going through. You've lost a loved one. You've lost your father or your mother. Well, uh, I'm sorry to hear this, but don't begin to start sharing the gospel immediately, right? Take your time. Uh, empathize with them, right? Uh, try to understand what they're going through. Uh, be there for them. Right? Uh, that, that's very, very important. All right. So we become all things to all people, which means we step into their world, we go where they are, we relate and identify with them, right? So even as we do that, you know, we relate to them, we identify with them. We must remember to always remain obedient to Christ. Why? Because sometimes, you know, in, in the urge of reaching them in, an, in, a, in a zeal for getting them to accept Christ, sometimes we may end up saying the wrong things. We may say a couple of lies. We may say something that may not be completely true. Or we may say things that may, uh, you know, cause hurt to their culture or religion. Now, we must be obedient to Christ, obedient to His, you know, to the Word of God, what He has said. Right? Uh, we cannot have that attitude of, "Hey, I know everything," and then beginning to share the gospel. Right? Uh, being obedient to Christ also also involves being humble, being true, being kind, being loving, right? The fruit of the spirit, being patient, right? And of course, the end result is to get them to uh, accept Christ as their personal savior, right? Be culturally sensitive, be culturally relevant, right? What works in one place may not work in another place, right? So for example, even if you look at urban cities, Different cities have different cultures, right? Uh, and so, for example, if we are in Bangalore, you look at Bangalore, there's a lot of youth. The culture is very different here, right? People like to go out in the evenings. People like to spend a lot of time in the evenings. Uh, they go out, meet friends, go to malls, go to places. Uh, that's a general culture in a city like Bangalore, right? So what will work? Um, you know, doing outreaches in the evenings or doing some youth-related events, youth-related programs. Uh, and we also know that, uh, you know, a city like Bangalore has a lot of, you know, uh, teens who are going through, you know, identity crisis. They don't know what they, what they want to be. Or they, they have, you know, uh, are thinking about their future. They've got fear. They've got doubts. So if you compare this to another city, for example, I was in the city of Mangalore. It's very different in Mangalore. So in Mangalore, it's people like to work, they go home, right? They don't like to come out after that, right? They, they, don't, they don't prefer to go out to malls and all of that. So it's a very different kind of a lifestyle, but it's a city, right? So being culturally relevant is very important. In some places, house visits work. In some cities, house visits don't work. Right now, for example, in Bangalore, house visits very rarely work because it, everyone are busy. Right, but if you look at uh, others, other cities, maybe going up north, the, the house visits really work. House press, right? So being culturally sensitive. Right. Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, he, he's talking about how he was able to be a Jew to the Jew, a Greek to the Greek, uh, and, and he was everything to everyone. Right? 
uh, then we seek not to intentionally offend the people. Right? Now, even as we minister to people, we must not offend the people. They may be rich, poor, right? They may be, uh, you know, happy, sad, whatever they're going through. They may be, uh, you know, doing something that is totally opposite to the word of God. Whatever it is, remember, we are not to offend people. Right? So, for example, if you're sharing the gospel with somebody, uh, we are not to say, hey, how can you even, you know, you're such a learned person, you have such high intellect. How can you? bow down to an idol, it doesn't make sense. Now, what are we doing? That's offending that person. Now, that person doesn't know that's an idol. For him, it's different. It's worship for him, right? Uh, so the way we put across things must be very, very, uh, you know, in a very positive way, in a very, our words, the, the way we frame our sentences, very important, right? Uh, and I believe that the first, Two, three minutes when you speak to a person, uh, that's what matters. Right? That first two, three minutes. And even as you continue the conversation, try and do your best not to intentionally offend people. You know, some of the things that people believe in in other faiths are absurd, meaning they are so ridiculous, they don't make sense at all. Uh, but we don't have to laugh about it, mock them. We don't have to do that, right? But we must minister in such a way that we draw them to Christ. Right? So don't look at what they are doing, but look at what you can offer them. And they may be doing 100 things wrong, but the truth can set that 100 things away. The truth of God's word, the truth of the gospel can put all those 100 things away. And the person can follow that one truth. Right? So focus on, when you're sharing the gospel, focus on God's word, the truth of God's word. You will, you know, even now, when many people come to us, you know, they, uh, they go through a lot of things. They open up to us, they share their problems, and they say, you know, these are the things we've done wrong. And the first thing we do is we don't say, hey, why you did this wrong? Why you did that wrong? You know, because of this, this is what's going to happen. We don't do all that, right? All we do is say, hey, yes, we understand that these things are happening. The enemy is, uh, but God has given us the authority. God has given us weapons that we can overcome all of this. So we help them through the process. Uh, because when they're already down, if you start offending them, they're going to go even more down. Right? Then there's no way for them to uh, open up and share with us. Right? So the Apostle Paul also says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 3 and 4, uh, he talks about how he did his ministry in every area. Right? He talks about his uh, rights of being an apostle. He talks about how he was uh, he kept himself pure before the eyes of man, before the eyes of God. And the way he did his ministry was pure in the sight of God. Right? Uh, there, was, there was no blame. Uh, for example, later on in Second Corinthians, right? What happens is the believers in Corinth they they save up some money which they want to send to Jerusalem, right? Because Jerusalem was a poor church, they needed money, they needed they were going through difficulties, persecutions. So the church in Corinth saved up some money to give it to uh, Jerusalem. Now the apostle Paul was going to Jerusalem, but what he did was, Apostle Paul said, Titus and my team are coming there. You give it to them. Give them money, the offering that you have got. Give it to them. They will go and give it to the church in Jerusalem. And then when I go there, I will inform them that the church in Corinth have blessed you with this offering. Now you see this. He, he goes on later on to say why he did this. Because he didn't want anyone to blame him for misuse of finances. So you see, the Apostle Paul, even in the smallest of things, he did ministry in a way that there was no opportunity for blame. But anybody could have said, hey, Apostle Paul, you got the money from uh, Corinth to here. 
how much did you put in your pocket? Right. Uh, but there was he didn't get that opportunity. He said, Titus and my team are coming there. They will come. They'll hand over the money to you in front of the church. And then I will come and I will, you know, uh, exhort you and encourage you for, for, you know, for what you have done within the church community. So you see that when we do ministry, we do it in the right way without blame. Nobody should blame. Uh, be right in the sight of man. Be right in the sight of God. Right. So God has commissioned us to preach. We preach even if we are told not to. Right? Now, this is the hard truth. Uh, but this is not something new. Remember Jesus? He was preaching the gospel everywhere. What did they tell him? You better stop this preaching. Otherwise, there are going to be consequences. Now, Jesus knew there's going to be consequences, but he didn't stop. Look at the apostle Paul. He, he went into Macedonia. Right, uh, and when he went there, he he knew the challenges ahead of him. He knew that there was going to be persecution. He knew that if he goes to Jerusalem and preaches, they're going to catch him. They're going to kill him this time, right? But it didn't stop him. He said, "God has commissioned us to preach. We will preach." Of course, uh, he used the wisdom of God. God led him in every way. Uh, we are to ensure. That we are not violating other people's property or their time when we are preaching the gospel. Right? Uh, so a few ways where we can identify and develop strategies, right? For one is we can develop for different age groups. So within your city, look at different age groups. So you've got children, you got teens, you got youth, uh, you got young couples, then you got the older couples, and you got the senior citizens. Right, uh, so identify and develop strategies for them. So for teens, what can you do? Okay, teens are going through, you know, identity crisis, or they're going through suicidal tendencies. This is basically happening in this uh, age group. So let me, you know, let's let's plan a meeting or a conference in terms of talking about, you know. Uh, suicide or avoiding depression or avoiding how to overcome uh, peer pressure and uh, anxieties in life. So you can do that. Uh, then you look at middle aged uh, or, or young couples, you know, how to live a good married life, a pleasing married life. Then you look at uh, older couples, you know, how to live a holy life, honorable to God. So you divide your, uh, you know, you identify you. And then you you divide them into groups and you see how you can minister to them. Develop strategies, have your own ideas. Right now, a youth uh, a, a worship concert will not work for middle-aged couples. They're not going to come. It's definitely going to be for teens and youth. Right. So you, we have to develop strategies that way. Develop diff uh, for different areas of need in the city. So uh, again, what is the need in the city? Uh, uh, it could be, you know, there's a there's a problem of morality, or people don't know, uh, you know, people are have work pressure, work life balance, right? That's a need. Like, you know, people are doing very successful in their business or their work, but if we look at their family, they're broken. Families are broken, and right? so this is a tendency that we're seeing, right? Or money, uh, just acquiring wealth has become a very important aspect. Right. So you talk about these areas, right? Then you look at the different spheres, the seven spheres of influence, uh, right? Then you use tools that God has given us, right? Leveraging available tools like you got your YouTube, you got Facebook, Instagram, you got uh, you know videos that you can you know uh, share with people, pictures, uh, things that you can share about the gospel. Um, you know, one of the things that I have shared with a couple of folks is, uh, I, I don't know if you've heard about this, but there's a series called The Chosen. And uh, I, I shared this whole thing with a couple of people that I know of. And, uh, you know, they were so excited. They were so happy because it was nothing. It was just a link that I sent them. I said, hey, when you're free, just, you know, maybe you can watch this. And they were so happy to you know, to watch the chosen because the chosen it basically depicts Jesus as a very 
you know, a very natural person, uh, just going through regular things in life, uh, but yet walked in such power. So it was, it, it's very powerful. So, so you can use these tools, right, to uh, reach out to people. I'm sure all of us have phones. You can send videos and clippings and uh, Bible verses. Right? Many a times, it, these Bible verses that people have sent has been an encouragement. Right? So use these tools. So here's, here are listed some of the strategies. These are things that we do at uh, APC. For children, it is Catalyst. Of course, there's even uh, Children's Church on Sundays, Children's Church programs. Catalyst is a program which goes to like uh, uh, people, uh, the Catalyst program, the educators, they go to schools. And uh, for different sections, they have one hour of teaching from God's word. And so the word is word of God is going into uh, children of different ages. Then you got the youth, uh, special seminars, you know, coffee talks, campus elevate. Campus elevate is basically colleges. Uh, so we go into colleges, uh, again, one hour of uh, maybe a few songs. And then there's a, you know, there's a preaching or a teaching of God's word. Again, many have been blessed by that we've been doing this since 2008 or so uh, then the youth concerts uh, campus programs prayer we, we also started campus programs in the sense there were campus groups which was prayer groups in different colleges uh, which used to meet during the breaks lunch breaks and uh, uh, that again uh, many many colleges are our church folks are leading those campus groups and then there are youth events, youth retreats, youth programs, youth camps, all of that. Uh, then you got the young adults preparing for marriage, uh, workplace groups, professional conferences, and married families there. We have the Chrysalis counseling, seminars, workshops, parenting workshops, a women's conference, and men's conference. Right. So these are some of the things we've been doing. So that's why it's all listed here. Uh, strategies addressing areas of need. Again, suicide, drug addiction, seeking jobs, financial guidance for the homeless, slums. Uh, and again, wherever possible, being available to serve. So for example, um, we have, you know, uh, we have served in quite a few um, ministries which work with slum children right so we used to go there and uh, you know, the, the ministry is led by somebody else but they would call us and so we would go and uh, uh, teach them god's word now when we talk about teach it's not like you know big uh, you know uh, theological questions and answers these are like, small you know slum children they don't have much of an education so we used to go and we should just share what Jesus did and how Jesus can help them, uh, uh, you know, in their studies, in, their, in, in whatever they have and how, you know, maybe we have a little, but God has blessed us. He, he you know, uh, we can work hard, achieve everything that God, you know, that you want to work, uh, achieve. So just an encouragement just to be there for them and to let them know that, hey, I mean that nobody cares for you or you know so many a times we we have football matches there uh between you know different areas so we uh you know just be part of it and just again before the match we would pray we would pray with them we would you know uh so it's really wonderful so addressing areas of certain needs now for example um you know i remember going to mumbai many many years ago and uh we went into this red light area right now we know that uh you know mumbai is known for that right so we went into the red light area i think it was somewhere during the early uh it was 2010 or uh, uh, the early time of christmas or uh, december time we went in the month of december so the first week of december i guess and we did carols right on the road in the you know uh, uh, so the road is here you got uh, it's a red light area so you got houses here houses here on both sides and they were all prostitutes right they were all standing and watching and there were little kids uh, the children of these prostitutes and uh, you know we just went there 
and it was really heartening heartening to see and even disheartening to see the things that have been gone uh, that they have gone through and uh, how many of them have been forced into it sometimes we have the picture that hey you know they want to do it because they enjoy it no but many many a times they're forced into it for money or or or, for, or they're bribed into it and then there's no way out right? uh, uh, so so it's not easy right so different strategies for different areas um then different strategies on the, now the seven mountains here is listed here the seven spheres or the seven mountains uh in society that's education then you got arts and entertainment then media business government family and religion so these are known as the seven spheres or the seven mountains of influence in any society anywhere around the world these are the seven spheres you got education arts and entertainment there's media there's business government family and religion so you we come up with different strategies so one of the ways that uh, <clears throat> we've been reaching out to uh, people in business was uh, we have one of the books called uh, timeless principles of the workplace uh, times with principles for the workplace and uh, you know we we had these books uh, uh, we sent it out to a couple of companies here uh, id companies around here and uh, we request them hey can we come and you know share these principles uh, you know they said yes you can come but no talking too much about jesus uh, but you can definitely share the principle but then we went to many of these id companies who we were able to talk about the principles of God, and uh, and how you know uh, we did you know share Bible verses and uh, and we still do that every now and then. But post pandemic, uh, we have to restart that. Um, uh, education, of course, colleges and schools. We're already doing that. Religion, we've been going through uh, to different ministries and helping them. And so ways in which now I understand that some of us may think, hey, I'm alone. Uh, or I'm have yet to start my own ministry. Now keep all this in the back of your mind, right? Now remember that uh, we talked about a bit briefly last class, right? A vision is something that God gives us. We need to look ahead, see what you will be ten years down the line, see what you want to do fifteen years down the line. Plan ahead. Uh, the Lord Jesus planned ahead and way ahead of time, right? He knew. What he was doing, how he was doing, and why he was doing it. Right. So, as as believers, we we must plan. I always say this: failing to plan is planning to fail. Right. So, if we don't plan, we are planning to fail. We must plan. Right. Um, even if you planning to, you know, you just thought about a ministry, or you're, you know, trying to do something in the ministry. Write them down. Come up with ideas. Come up with strategies. Pray on it. I'm sure God will open the right door for you, right? For each of you, right? Let's go to the next one. Fourth one, strategies, leveraging available tools. So again, uh, books, newspapers, internet is huge now uh, with social media. Uh, and there's television, not much happening right now. Uh, there used to be this, you know, these ads that used to come up in the, you know, TV ads. Uh, but not much of that happening now. But again, you can see what you what what works. Like for example, uh, I, I read this uh, article recently that which said that Bangalore has the highest number of Instagram users in the world. Right now, I don't know how correct or incorrect that data could be, but uh, I have a feeling it's true because. It's Bangalore's a cosmopolitan city. It's got people from different places coming in, different cities, different nations. And imagine we post something, right? We can just post a picture or a word, and you've got thousands of people who can read it. And it can touch people's lives. It could be a two minute devotional, a five minute devotional, a five minute message, an encouragement from God's word, anything. Uh, so you leverage the tools that are available uh, right now, right? So these are the different ways in which we can 
uh, really focus evangelism in terms of uh, uh, in cities, especially. Right. So quickly, let's go to uh, sharing Christ with a Hindu. Uh, of course, we did it a little bit. Uh, any questions, anybody? Uh, everyone okay? You're able to understand? Everyone okay? Should I, should I carry on? Okay, sharing Christ with a Hindu. Now, we did talk about this briefly. Uh, when we share with somebody, uh, now when we're talking about a Hindu, firstly, we must understand what is their background. Right? Now, Hindu has three, uh, the Hinduism has 330 million gods and goddesses. Right? So you and I don't understand where are they coming from? What is their background? Right? A little bit about their background, right? Now, when we know the person we are talking to, or when we understand the person's faith, we will be able to, you know, give a good defense uh, for the gospel. Now, you learn more of this. This is just an overview. I think it's next semester. You will have apologetics. Apologetics is the uh, is the is uh, how to give a right defense for the gospel. Uh, so we're just going to do a quick overview of sharing Christ with a Hindu. Right? Now, what are some of the differences? We believe that God is the one true God, righteous, wise, loving, merciful. Now, Hinduism has 330 million gods and goddesses. So they have a wide range, right? They have Every city, every town, every village, every section of people have their own God. Can you can you picture this? Uh, a nation with one billion people have one just one religion has three hundred and thirty million gods and goddesses. Now, it's it's just overwhelming to read that because. You see, we know the one true God, but they have so much of a choice. Right? What does it say in Christianity? We are sinful, but Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. Hence, we are valuable to God. In Hinduism, they are part of God. Right? Whether they are sinful, whether they are not sinful, they are part of God already. Right? That's Fallible word of God. When you say infallible, it means there is no error. Right? It's, a, it's written by men and women of God, but it's infallible. There's no error. Now, Hindus, and we've got the Vedas. The Vedas were written over uh, uh, over over a period of many years, uh, but we don't know whether. There is no historical proof of their writings as well, right? Uh, then you got Jesus Christ, who Christianity believes that God became man and died on the cross, took our sins on the cross, rose up from the dead, and now through God we have provision of salvation. Right? Now, what do the Hindus think about Jesus Christ? One, he is either ignored. Or two, he's he's not an Indian god. He's a you know a god of another country, right? Or he's you know, you know it's an offense because he died as a murderer, right? And he was murdered. He was he he died as somebody who was uh, uh, you know in an offensive manner. So the, not many times is accepted, but again. Some group of people, when we share, they do accept it, right? Uh, then you got life purposes. What do Christians believe? Our main purpose in life, hopefully, is for all of us, is to know God through a personal faith and relationship with Jesus Christ, build on a relationship 
and to do His will. That's our main purpose in life, to glorify God in everything that we do. Right Now, what's the purpose of Hindus? You see that to work out bad karma through knowledge, devotion, and good deeds. So you got karma, you got the weighing scale. Right Here are your good deeds, here are your bad deeds. Now, if I've done more bad deeds, I have to work out my karma, which is my salvation or my, my future, my dependency. I have to work it out through knowledge. I either have to procure knowledge, or then I have to go into a mountain or do something through devotion, or then I have to do some good deeds. Right. So you see here that salvation or karma is attained through works. But here, the Lord Jesus. Has done it for us and we don't have to go through works right look at heaven the the christian the bible teaches us in christianity that's the place of eternal joy for those who have received god's gift of salvation and what do the hindus believe uh nirvana which is moksha which is liberation uh from the repeated cycle of birth so let me give you this thing right in hinduism you've got the you know the whole cycle karma so if you didn't attain the right you know the right position you die you become you get rebirth again then you die you get rebirth again you die and you get rebirth reborn again but there'll come a time where you've done everything right then you have attained nirvana which is moksha then the 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 that whole rebirth is over Right, uh, and our spirit will go, and um, you know, will become divine. Right, uh, there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. So that's what they believe in. Right, uh, but it's an ongoing process, karma. Now, how do we know that uh, this person is going to attain nirvana or no? We don't know, but it's over. It could be years. It could be centuries to be any amount of years it, it's just a process but what does the bible teach us to be absent in the body is to be present with the lord such a joy what does it say about hell it's a place of eternal torment for those who have rejected jesus christ now for for hinduism this earth uh and trapped in the cycle of reincarnation birth and death birth and death that itself is a hell why because i need to achieve achieve, uh, achieve nirvana or moksha only then i am free so you see there's a lot of difference right between these two now sharing the gospel with somebody who's hindu faith is not going to be easy but here are pointers that you can emphasize which is one i've just marked it yellow the existence of sin and evil the bible reveals it karma and reincarnation also has the cause and the effect so there is sin and evil there forgiveness of sins what does the bible talk about forgiveness and what does hinduism say about forgiveness and how we can obtain that forgiveness now this is the most powerful way to reach out to a hindu the moment you talk about forgiveness in their mind is go up the mountain do some works maybe you roll around kneel down on nails and all these works to achieve forgiveness but here when we speak about free forgiveness it is a concept that they don't understand because somebody else paid the price and we can be free we can be forgiven of our sins so they usually incline towards this forgiveness right so then Christ contrasted in many avatars. Now, uh, Christ was, you know, you can talk about Christ's uniqueness. He was sinless. He was perfect. He was sufficient. He was a real human being, right? Now, sometimes people will, uh, you know, have asked me, how do you know Jesus did this? Jesus did. How do you know that Jesus was even crucified? How do you know that he was even, that he even lived? Now, history proves that he was born. History proves because secular writers have written about his uh, about his life, about his death as well. Uh, so there was a man named Jesus. 
and he was unique he was a he had a great following uh and history also proves that there was a resurrection he was his body was not found right so we can use these as as uh you know points of sharing the gospel right uh, but if you look at the hindu faith if you talk about rama and all these other people uh, there is no historical proof of their living right there's no proof at all right so so then you know these are things that you can add now we must be careful how we say that right we can't say hey you know what i have proof that jesus lives show me the proof where is we can't speak that way uh, again just focus on what we have focus on uh, the gospel the truth of what we have uh, and that will eliminate everything that is false right uh quickly sharing christ with the muslim now again muslim islam a uh, lot of similarities uh, god is one eternal triune god righteous wise and loving allah is one and eternal almost the same man is sinful but valuable in, uh, to god but look at what islam thinks islam believes that every man is basically good right so we are good and then we have to do things to make allah uh, to please allah right then you go to scripture which is the bible and here they have the quran um now the quran itself you have the quran and the hadith which was written many many years later uh now between the quran and the hadith there were so many contradictions among them but you look at the bible even though it's written you know 66 books 40 different authors but over a period of many years the authenticity is still the same there is no contradiction everyone were aligned right now look at life's purposes christianity again to glorify god islam to submit to allah heaven uh, place of eternal joy uh, but in islam uh, it is only those who God chooses will be in heaven, right? It's not for everyone. But here in Christianity, we all accept Christ. We receive God's gift of salvation. But here, even if you are a, you know, a Muslim, even if you go to do your penance and all of that, only if Allah agrees to choose, then you'll be in heaven. And when you go to heaven, that's a different story. You'll have, you know, different seven uh, virgins and all these other things there in heaven. Uh, but that's a different story. So you, you see that difference there. Only if Allah decides to choose. Right? And what about hell? It's a place of uh, torment for those who rejected Christ. Here, it's a place of torment rejected by Allah. Now, what are the common things here? God, which is eternal for both Allah and for, for Christianity and Islam. Two, that Jesus Christ was became uh, you know was the only way of problem. So they believe that Jesus was a prophet. Three is heaven because they both we both believe in heaven, and four we both believe in hell. So a lot of similarities, yet a lot of separation from Christianity. Right. Uh, I'll just quickly just take another two minutes, please. Uh, the five pillars of Islam mentioned here, Shahada, which is the confession of faith, Salat, which is praying for five five times a day, uh, Zakat, which is alms to the poor, Son, which is fasting in the month of Ramadan, Hajj, which is a pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina as well, and then the Jihad, which is a holy war against those who don't believe in Islam. Right now, let's look at these points of emphasis. Right, three things that people would normally question in in Islam: whether Christ is God, whether He died on the cross, whether He rose again from the dead. Right. So these are the normal questions, and we must be ready to give answers to these questions. Whether Christ is God, how will we answer it? Two whether he died on the cross and we have historical proof for that and three whether he rose from the dead 
And I want to close with this. There was this two friends. Uh, there were these two friends, right? Uh, I think you know them. Uh, uh, you must have heard of them, Nabil Qureshi and uh, you know, Sam Simon. Uh, you know, one was a Muslim, one was a Christian. And this man, Sam, uh, the, the believer, they both were very good friends, but they, he did not share the gospel in a sense, but he only brought historical proof of the Lord Jesus Christ. And through the historical proof, he was able to share the gospel. And this, and, and we all know Nabil Qureshi, right? Became a great apologist. Uh, and now he's gone home to be with the Lord. So, so yes, sometimes it's not only through our intellect. Sometimes God can use history. God can use geography. He can use anything to touch people's lives. Sorry, I saw, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of messages here on uh, the group. It is written in our notes that God commissioned us to preach. So we preach even if we are told not to. The apostles did this, which was why they were persecuted. In our time, OK. Yes, so Nina, it, it, it's true that the, they were led by the Holy Spirit. Now, we must understand that God was, the Lord Jesus was establishing a church at that time. right? Uh, so they, there would needed to be that zeal, that passion. Right. But many a time, look at the Lord Jesus. Many a times, even he walked in great wisdom. Right. He uh, there were places that he says, no, it's not my time yet. I should not go there because if I go, I'll be caught uh, and they may uh, you know, put me into prison and all of that. So now God has given us the wisdom, for example, the new law that has passed. It's an infringement on our rights, right? Uh, saying that we can't share about the gospel but we have to share the gospel right we have to share the, we i mean we have to there will be people we have to bring out the gospel now we need to do it in a wise way right uh like for example you know if, if a hindu or a muslim becomes a believer and he says baptize me now you you tell them okay now we can't do it like how we did at that time uh but we have to understand, okay, there are things that have changed. Uh, we have to walk in wisdom, right? Uh, it's not that we are not as bold as the apostles before, right? Of course, God gave them great, uh, great power and uh, great authority, great faith. We can walk in that authority, but we must also remember to uh, obey the law, right? Now, now even though you know, we, we are Christians, we are believers, we must obey the law, but we are also to preach the gospel. If, if the law says don't preach the gospel, we have to preach the gospel. And here, the law says that we do not, we must not entice people. Right? So if we go through the whole thing, it's not, we should not entice people. We should not, uh, you know, draw them towards Christianity. Right? But if a Hindu or a Muslim says, hey, going through this problem, definitely pray for them. Right? That's not uh, you know, conversion and all of that. Right? Pray for them. Right? Yeah. So, so we must be careful on how we do these things. Right? OK, so uh, we've come to the end of our course. Uh, thank you so much for you know, joining along with me. Uh, I'm sure the next semester, even as you continue to study, we learn more about evangelism, about things, uh, about the apologetics and much more. So thank you so much. Have a great week. All the best for your uh, coming tests and exams and assignments. And uh, God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. Uh, see you soon. Bye.